my name is Caitlin and I'm an educator for King County Wastewater Treatment. Uh, I am here at the wastewater treatment plant standing around tanks filled with wastewater that is partially treated. I am a tall white woman with mostly straight blonde hair and a big smile. I am wearing a long sleeve jacket and my personal protective gear. Uh, a yellow hard hat, glasses, and an orange reflective vest. Uh, I am here with my coworkers today and we will be giving you a tour of the wastewater treatment plant located in Renton, Washington. We are going to be exploring together how millions of gallons of wastewater are cleaned every day at this facility and what valuable resources we can recycle from this process. Hi, I'm Kristen and I'm also an educator with the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. So I get to teach people about water systems and how they impact them every day. And I have been working here for 10 years, so I am slightly older than my other co-workers with me today. Um, I am also a white woman. I have short, light brown hair, average height, and I am also decked out in the safety gear, hard hat, safety glasses, and a vest. Hi, I'm Charity. I'm also an educator at King County Wastewater Treatment. I'm a short white woman with shoulder length, curly brown hair, and I'll be talking about our second step in the wastewater treatment process. Hi everyone, I'm Sienna, and I'm another wastewater educator. I'm a tall white woman with short hair, not to be confused with Kristen, and I'm wearing safety gear and I'm dressed for the cold weather too. This is Caitlin again. So to begin, let's discuss what is wastewater. Wastewater is all of the used or dirty water leaving buildings from different drains, like toilets, sinks, showers, dishwashers, and washing machines. Another word for wastewater is sewage. Wastewater comes to the King County Wastewater Treatment Plant from apartments, houses, and from businesses, and even schools, too. People use water for a lot of different purposes, like cooking, bathing, flushing toilets. So a lot of stuff gets in that water really quickly. We divide all those things into wastewater categories. We will show examples of common items found in each category as well as list them. The first category is trash. Things like wet wipes, wrappers, paper towels, condoms, tampons, and toys. The second category is organic, such as poop, food scraps, grease, and uh, cooking oil. The third category is chemicals. Things like shampoo, conditioner, toothpaste, medications, and cleaning products. The final category is microorganisms. And these include both the good and bad bacteria, all the microscopic organisms that live in people's bodies and on people's bodies get washed into our system too. What do you think wastewater looks like? What words come to mind when you think about wastewater? I'm holding a glass jar of what wastewater looks like. This is what the water looks like when it arrives at the treatment plant. It's slightly muddy water, and the reason it isn't as thick and as dark as most people think is because it's mostly water. Nevertheless, there's lots of stuff that needs to be cleaned out in this water. King County Wastewater Treatment Division is responsible for collecting and cleaning waste from wastewater from a very large geographical area, which covers the areas between Mill Creek in the north, Sammamish in the east, Auburn in the south and Seattle in the west. There are over 1.7 million people living in this service area, which means there is a lot of wastewater every day to be collected and cleaned. In order to accomplish this task, there are over 400 miles of underground pipe and many different pump stations that use energy to push wastewater through the pipes all the way to one of our treatment plants. It kind of acts like a human circulatory system. We operate five different wastewater treatment plants in this area. Two small ones, one being in Carnation, the second on Bashon Island. There are three large wastewater treatment plants. The first is in Woodenville, the second is in Seattle, and the third is in Renton. Each of these treatment plants are responsible for treating a total of 200 million gallons of wastewater every day. That is like 10,000 swimming pools of dirty water. Now that you know the basics of wastewater and our treatment system, we are going to take you through different steps of the wastewater treatment plant process to learn how it's cleaned. 
Kristen, take it away. Hello again, this is Kristen here, and I'm going to teach you about the first two steps of cleaning the wastewater. The first step is focused on removing trash in the water. Most trash comes from things people shouldn't flush down their toilets, like wipes, tissues, and feminine products. We remove these items first because they're the largest pollution items in the water, so they're easy to take out. Plus, they would do a lot of damage down the line to other equipment if we kept them in the water. As you might have guessed, the easiest way to separate out the trash is by passing the wastewater through a screen, which is similar to straining pasta. So that way we can actually capture the trash and easily remove it. But since we're dealing with a lot of water in the system, we use large machines called bar screens. These machines are rectangular in shape and they are 15 feet tall and six feet wide. We have eight bar screens at this treatment plant and they are located in the building behind me, two stories below ground level. Let's go check out those screens, but first I need some ear protection because it's really loud down there. Follow me. We're standing two stories below ground level in a room that contains eight giant bar screens. It's loud and wow, it really smells in here. If I had to describe it, I'd say it smells like a garbage dumpster on a hot summer day or a really, really, really rotten egg. Let's examine these screens in action so I can get out of here. The water goes into narrow channels that each contain a bar screen. The bars are spaced about a pinky width apart so they can stop most of the trash pieces as the water passes through. And then a metal scraper pushes the trapped trash up the machine and out of the channel. Okay, so we got out of that smelly building and now we are back outside and behind me is the trash processing building. So we got most of it out of the water, but then what happens next to it? After it's removed from the water, it's dropped into a grinding machine behind me to grind it up into small pieces. And then it's dropped into a giant dumpster below, which is large enough to hold 42 twin-sized mattresses. So it's really big. When the dumpster gets full, the contaminated trash gets hauled to a landfill. We fill up one of these dumpsters and send it to a landfill once every week. I'm holding a large, clear container in the shape of a cube. And inside this container is one cubic foot of dried wastewater trash, which is similar to the size of a large microwave. This is how much trash we remove at this treatment plant every two minutes. What we find in here are tampon applicators, random wrappers, and a lot of brown stained paper, which are probably tissues or wipes that have been in the system. We like to help people remember what to flush by telling them only to flush the four P's. Pee, poop, toilet paper, and puke. Toilet paper is the only paper product that should be flushed. And if everyone followed this rule, we could skip this step of wastewater treatment and save hundreds of thousands of dollars every year spent on unclogging pipes that have too much trash. Okay, I've left the trash screening area and walked a short distance to the next step, which is called primary treatment. Nearly all of the trash is out of the water now, so the next task is to work on removing the organic matter, which is mostly poop and also food and grease from kitchen sinks. It's happening in the tanks behind me, but before I take you over there, I want to demonstrate what's going on with a model of the process. Okay, so while I'm shaking this model, it looks like a dark brown color and everything's all mixed up. Once I stopped shaking this model, three layers started forming. Heavier material is sinking to the bottom. In the wastewater, it would be the poop and food particles. Lighter material that is less dense than water is floating to the top. In the wastewater tanks, it's going to mostly be grease and oil, but also some soaps and chemicals. And in the middle, is the cleanest layer that we will move on to the next step for further treatment. But now that we have stuff separated, we can use equipment in the tanks to remove them. Let's go check it out. I'm standing at the end of one of the tanks to show you how we remove the top layer of grease and oil. The grease and oil layer is very thin, so we have mechanical sprayers that spray water onto the surface, like lawn sprinklers, to push and move the grease towards a giant metal scraper at the end of the tank. The scraper is in the shape of a spiral, so as the spiral turns, it's able to collect the grease on the surface and empty it into a channel on the other side. 
and that takes it out of the tank. We use a similar method for the poop and food that collects on the bottom of the tank. We have bars that are on a track that are spaced about six feet apart. And as the track moves really slowly, the bars move and scrape the material that have collected on the bottom, pushing it towards the end of the tank where it dips down lower like the deep end of a swimming pool. There's a pipe and pump attached to the bottom of the tank that sucks the material out. Now I hope you're asking yourself, but where does it go? If so, great question. It doesn't just disappear. We have to do something with it. Unfortunately, you'll have to wait for the answer, but towards the end of the video, we will talk about where both the grease and the poop and food go once we remove them. So remember that bottle of raw sewage or influent that Caitlin showed you at the beginning of this video? Well, here it is again. And here is what the water looks like after primary treatment. This is a sample of primary effluent. So the influent or raw sewage is a lot cloudier, or we like to say turbid. And the primary sample is less cloudy and more clear. So this is a pretty effective process. We're able to remove about 50% of the solid particles from this process. So we can do this by using a low energy, very passive process, and it's pretty effective. But we still have a long ways to go. We still need to remove bacteria, chemicals, and suspended organic particles. Hi, this is Charity again. The next process, the next part of the treatment process is my favorite, secondary treatment, or aeration. I'll be describing the water tanks and how the aeration process works. After we remove 50% of the solids in the primary settling tanks, we pump water into the tanks behind me. These tanks are huge. They're 18 feet deep, the size of three and a half of me stacked on top of each other. So you can't really tell since the water is so opaque. The water in the tanks is now thicker and brown with a brown foam on the top. It reminds me of root beer float. The air doesn't smell bad here, at least not to me. The smell reminds me kind of like baking bread. You can also hear a high pitched hum standing here. That noise is coming from towers that are intaking air. The air is then heated and released into the bottom of these tanks through big diffusers. The hot air is then activating special microbes, causing them to reproduce and multiply. These microbes are naturally occurring in the wastewater. They come mostly from our digestive systems. The microbes thrive in warm, oxygen-rich water, and they help clean the water by eating the remaining poop and food. This bubbly chocolate milkshake is actually a complex ecosystem of those tiny creatures. The tiniest creatures, the single cell bacteria, form big clumps in the water. The other creatures in the water are much bigger. Some of them are even tiny animals. These creatures eat some of the organics as well as consume pathogens, bacteria that can make us sick. Here's a footage of a rotifer, a nematode, and a tardigrade, some of the creatures that are living in this water. I like to think of these tiny creatures as our pets that are helping us clean the water. And they're really, really tiny. Some of them are so small, you could fit 100 of them on the end of one of your hairs. The water swirls around these tanks for two to three hours before it's pumped through underground pipes to the next step, the clarifying tanks. After spending several hours in aeration, the water is sent to these large tanks called clarifiers. We need to get the creatures and the organisms now trapped in their body out of the water. The tanks behind me are large and circular. They're set into the ground. This area is quiet. We aren't adding hot air anymore. In the tanks, there's an outer ring with water that is slowly moving. This water is clearer than the water in the last tank and now has quarter-sized clumps in it. In these tanks, water enters in the outer ring first, then the inner circle. The warm air is no longer added and in the cooler water, big clumps of organic material and microbes form. You can see that happening in the outer ring. The clumps settle to the bottom of the tank and are sent back to the aeration tanks. The remaining clean water moves on to the final step of treatment. This is also a spot that helps me conceptualize just how much water we clean here. There are 24 of these tanks in the area, the length and size of over three football fields. Here's the last step of the wastewater treatment process here at South Plant. I'm standing in front of a long, narrow tank. There's a second tank parallel to it that the water flows into then drops into a lower tank. The tank closest to me is the contact channel, 
At this point, we've removed the trash, organics, and bacteria, and many of the chemicals in the water. There might be a small amount of pathogens that have slipped through to the last step, so we add a chemical similar to chlorine bleach that sanitizes the water, killing off any remaining pathogens, like E. coli, things that can make us sick. In these channels, we introduce the water to the chemical and give it time to contact with the water and the germs. The sanitizing chemical breaks down in the water before it reaches the Puget Sound. Then the water moves through like a slow river. Looking down the tank, this water looks really clear. Then the water goes over into a lower tank, creating a short five-foot waterfall. The sound of all that water is really loud, and there's some mist that comes up. The water in the lower tank has many bubbles, in the water and on the surface. This waterfall isn't just a beautiful feature, it's actually adding dissolved oxygen into the water. Healthy water in the Puget Sound has some oxygen in it. That's what fish pull out of the water to breathe. It's important that the clean water we are piping in has similar high levels of oxygen so we aren't hurting wildlife. In my right hand, I'm holding up the sample jar of raw sewage that Caitlin showed you at the beginning. The water is cloudy and slightly yellow with small black pieces. In my left hand, I'm holding a jar of the cleaned water that's leaving the facility. This water is totally clear and free of any pieces. It looks similar to drinking water, but it's not. This water still has nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and trace levels of chemicals from cleaning products and medicines. After the waterfall, the water is piped 13 miles underground out to an outfall pipe off of West Seattle near Alki Beach. Hi everyone, this is Sienna again. Did you know that our wastewater can heat buildings, nourish plants, and water soccer fields? Believe it or not, there are valuable resources in wastewater and I'm going to be telling you about how we turn them into useful products. One thing you should know is that treating wastewater uses a lot of energy because it requires pumping millions of gallons of water from homes and businesses throughout our system of pipes and treatment plants every single day. King County Wastewater Treatment Division is focused on efforts to reduce our energy use and to recycle the resources that are in wastewater. Let's think back to the treatment process when the organic material, the poop and food, from primary treatment is separated from the water in those large settling tanks. This material travels to the enormous cylinder tanks behind me, which are called digesters. The digesters are covered and they're heated to 98 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the same temperature as our bodies. Inside the digesters, anaerobic microbes break down the organic material, which is similar to what happens in our own digestive systems. As those microbes consume the organic material, they produce methane gas. Methane gas is a greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change, so we definitely don't want to release it into the atmosphere. Instead, we capture it, clean it, and use it as an energy source that we call biogas. Biogas has multiple uses, including being converted into electricity and used as a renewable natural gas to heat homes and fuel garbage trucks. I'm now standing in front of our dewatering building. You may be wondering what happens to the organic material, the poop, food, and toilet paper in the digesters. Well, I'm happy to tell you that it also has an important use. After it's broken down, the organic material travels to our dewatering building here, where it gets spun in a centrifuge, which removes some of the water from it. The centrifuge spins the organic material just like a laundry machine's spin cycle helps dry out clothing. After this process, the organic material becomes what we call biosolids. The camera footage is showing the biosolids. Biosolids are dark, brown, clumpy, and they look like soil. They're full of nutrients. What do you think they're used for? Biosolids are used to provide nutrients to plants and build soil on farms and forests across Washington State. The King County brand of biosolids is called Loop. This map shows Washington State with pins and locations where Loop is distributed. These pins are located near King County, as well as in central and southern Washington. Loop is nourishing plants across the state. I'm standing in front of a large silver hauling truck with the word Loop written on it. These trucks transport Loop biosolids to farms and timber forests. Did you know that some of the foods we eat are grown with biosolids? Common foods grown with Loop include apples, wheat, hops, and canola. Loop provides essential nutrients to plants and helps build healthy soils that hold more water and attract beneficial insects. Unlike chemical fertilizers, biosolids are a renewable source of nutrients for plants. 
Businesses that use Loop handle it according to regulations to make sure that it meets safety requirements. This is important because there can be a small number of pathogens left in it after production. Loop, like all of our products, is regularly tested and regulated by the Department of Ecology to ensure its safety. Each year, King County produces over 120,000 tons of Loop, which is enough to fill a football stadium 70 feet high. If you live in the King County Wastewater Service Area, you help make Loop too. Now I'm standing in our demonstration garden surrounded by dogwood and other native plants. We keep this garden healthy with resources we get from wastewater. The purple irrigation hoses in this garden signal that we use recycled water here. Recycled water travels in purple pipes underground too to distinguish it from drinking water. So what is recycled water? Remember all of that treated water that leaves a treatment plant for Puget Sound? Well, there's a way to reuse that too. We turn a portion of it into recycled water by sending it through a sand filter so that it's extra clean. I'm holding a glass jar with a sample of recycled water in it. What stands out to me is how clear the water is. It looks nearly as clear as a glass of drinking water. Although this recycled water is very clean, it's not drinking water. The good thing is that we need water for more than drinking, right? And recycled water is a great fit for things like street cleaning and watering farms and sports fields. A fun fact about King County's recycled water is that it waters the fields that the Seattle Sounders soccer team practices on. Using recycled water helps keep more water in rivers and lakes for wildlife and for drinking water. Recycled water is an especially important resource because climate change reduces how much fresh water is available in the summer. Hi, this is Kristen again. I hope you enjoyed learning about this hidden system of wastewater treatment, including all of the surprising resources that we can reuse from it. I think it's amazing that this treatment process is going on 24 seven, even when many of us are sleeping. There are people that stay up all night making sure our wastewater treatment plants are operating properly. Here's an image of an operator dressed in safety gear doing maintenance on a pump. She's using a socket wrench to open a metal plate. Speaking of people, managing our region's wastewater is an enormous and extremely important task. For this reason, we have 650 employees to help keep it running. We take this job very seriously because cleaning wastewater protects public health and the environment. Plus, we operate on funding from the sewer portion of people's water bills in our service area. We need to use that money wisely and responsibly. Now that you have completed the journey through the wastewater treatment process with us and learned where your waste goes from start to finish, will you change what you put down the drain? Or what you flush down the toilet? Is there something you want to learn more about? If so, you can visit our website to check out more education resources or register to take a treatment plant tour in person. We've included the link in our website in the video description. Thanks for joining us. Bye.